All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so this session, we're just gonna go over some strategy and design stuff. Um, probably gonna keep it a little bit short. Uh, so we'll probably be done about 5.40 today. Uh, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the main thing we wanna talk about is the, the design process. So uh, this is used by all sorts of teams. Um, like I've worked on some satellite teams and I've worked on different robotics teams and this design process is used uh, in industry as well for, for all different sorts of objectives. Um, and it starts with developing a strategy and um, specific to FLL, you want to develop mission paths. Um, and then from that strategy and mission paths, you're going to determine robot requirements and then you're going to gain an understanding of your the system that you're using so that you can design your robot. And so in this presentation, we're mainly going to go over the first three. Um, and then next, or in a couple of weeks, we'll go over uh, the last one, which is a hefty task, since there's a lot to learn in robot design. Okay, so there's many different strategies for choosing um, uh, mission path planning. So this is a pretty good video that goes over FLL mission sequence and, and path strategy. Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about one of the most important issues that many of the new teams struggle with. Typically, in the World Robotics League, First Lego League, World Robotics Olympiad, and many other competitive robotics, the mission completion is time bound. Robot starts it at its base and the missions are distributed all over the robot work area. Some are closer, some are farther from the robot base and depending on the complexity, different missions have different score. Quite often, the newer teams struggle with this strategy uh, how to organize or how to come up with the proper uh, robot mission planning so that they can optimize their effort to get the maximum score. So what is referred to as path planning or process planning is I'm going to explain in this video here and suggest few strategies that will help you maximize the total score. So some of the important considerations. First, farther the robot travels, more the drift. We are going to talk about the drift issue a little bit later. Second, valuable time is lost in traveling. So as the robot is traveling, you are not actually collecting the score. It is just when the robot reaches to the mission, completes the mission, that is when you actually get the score points. Third, robot may reach to its destined point. However, it is very important that the robot is properly oriented with respect to the mission to engage with the mission and complete the task. So what we would like to suggest is you may collect the score for highly certain closer mission one at a time or you may combine multiple missions which are placed far from each other because you have already spent so much time in traveling. So let's explain the idea pictorially. So as you can see, the top robot is an EV3 based robot. And the next, the robot here is the spike prime robot. So as the robot starts from its initial point and travels because of the drift, the robot may not be only move from its intended point, its orientation may also change. So one of the strategies, as we discussed earlier, what you can do is the robot starts from its base position. It may go at very fast speed to the missions which are placed very close to the robot base. And the robot can afford to travel multiple times because the missions are closer. But robot can get, go at a faster speed. Also, since the missions are closer, the drift and the inaccuracies will be minimized. So 
the robot travels fast, completes the mission one, comes back, robot completes the mission two, comes back, robot completes the mission three, and comes back. So we leave it up to you to determine how far, like what is the distance that you would like to consider the closer missions and what distance you would like to consider for a mission to be a farther mission. So as you can see in the picture on the right hand side, if the robot has to travel far, it has spent significant amount of time in traveling to the farther missions. So it doesn't make sense for the robot to come back and forth. What you may do is you may combine the three missions. Another very useful strategy is divide and conquer. That is, in divide and conquer approach, you may divide the missions depending on the proximity. So say for example, there are multiple missions in this area. So you can assign this as one of the zones, zone four here, or zone five, zone three, zone two, the robot may reach to the, uh, the key point within that zone, attempt various missions in that zone, and it can either return to the base or it can move to the next zone and attempt the missions there. Few other very valuable inputs. As much as the mission completion is important, our creativity in design or programming to complete the mission is important. Be very creative about reducing the overall errors. It may so happen that out of 10 times, two times your robot works perfectly all right, but eight times robot is not able to complete the mission. That's uh, something to be concerned about. So be creative about reducing the errors so that you can complete the mission with high degree of certainty. Next, the order in which you run the robot or uh, the order in which you complete the mission, go from more certain to less certain. This is something that many teams do not pay attention to and lose very valuable time. When the robot is traveling, you are not collecting any score. Actually, when robot completes the mission, that is when you collect the score. So you may travel slow towards the mission to reduce the drift or reduce the error. But as soon as the mission is completed, and you have to return to the base, return as fast as you can. Another very valuable input, it is the overall score that matters. In case the robot has traveled very far and it will take significant amount of time to return to the base. It may travel straight, it may take multiple turns before it reaches to the base. So very valuable time is lost just for the robot to travel. And if you have a mission that you are planning to attempt after that run and that results in a higher score, do not hesitate in taking penalty and picking up the robot. Another very valuable input, think, think, think your strategy. You may run small missions that have high certainty and accumulate smaller points towards overall a large score instead of relying on a large complex mission at a risk of lower certainty. Another very valuable suggestion, run your robot on multiple tables. You can talk to other teams. You may let them use your table and you can request them to use their table so that you can perfect your robot in different kind of settings. Because believe me, most of the time there will be some degree of variation in the table that will be available in the field for your robot to run. Thank you. I hope you find this video useful. Please subscribe. Okay, yeah, so those are some strategies that um, many teams have used in the past. Um, personally, I haven't used, I've used something that's a little different that's on the next slide that worked uh, for two, three years when we tried it. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide.
All right, yeah. Um, so the the method that we used um, in FLL and that we've even carried out to like a uh, higher level, like FRC robots, is uh, points per second. Um, it's pretty simple. Where uh, at the when the challenge is released, you basically um, determine the missions that you think you'd be able to do, um, and some that you don't think you'd be able to do. Um, there's obviously some missions that are going to be much easier than others, and some missions that are going to be much harder than others. So you just have to identify um, what those missions are. Uh, and then uh, you want to uh, assign uh, uh, points for the path by saying, OK, like if we go out and we do these three missions, uh, we do one part of this mission or we do both parts of the mission, this is how many points we're going to get for that path. Um, and then we estimate time. And uh, obviously, this can be hard to do like uh, this is how much time it's going to take because especially if you're new, you have no idea how your robot's actually going to work and you don't know the limits of your robot. Um, so you can just assign um, like multipliers basically like, okay, you know, let's just turn on a robot, have it drive straight and then have it do a turn and see like the time difference. And then you can just add up uh, like basically tokens of time and see what type of mission path lets you have the most efficient time. Um, the other thing is that he talked about is like grouping by tasks. So if you have to do a lot of like picking things up, those are missions that you can group together because you can do those with just one attachment to do multiple things. So um, that's why you also have to identify the type of task of the mission. So when the season starts, what we usually do is make a spreadsheet, make a list of all the missions, uh, uh, and in a column put all the points, and then in another column put a type or the type of task. So it'll be like pick, place, um, like rotate, or uh -huh. you know, like uh, just move in a circle. And so those will be the types. And so then we'll try to organize them. Uh, and then we'll also do zoning, like what you talked about. So we'll put a zone in a location. Um, and then we'll just go through the sheet, look at them visually, say, OK, we can group these missions together. Um, and then we do our points per second to see which missions should be grouped together and then what the path should look like. Okay, um, once we created a mission paths and we finalized um, on usually three or four mission paths, uh, we have to work our mission paths and strategy into robot requirements. So um, these are some of the so these are some of the questions that we ask once we've determined our mission paths. Like um, uh, how fast will we need to go? Um, how many attachments, different types of attachments will we need in a single mission path? So do we need multiple motors for just attachments? Um, where they should mount? And then like any size constraints, constraints, because um, there's often like, you know, based on layout, there might be some areas where a wider robot just can't fit. So those are some things that we start to think about um, once we've developed the mission paths. Um, once we've done the mission paths, we have to start basically uh, for newer teams, especially understanding what the system is so that we can uh, start doing robot design. Um, so in the next few slides, we're just going to cover basically the entire EV3 system, you know, how the motors and sensors all work and, and what they are. So uh, next slide is going to talk about the EV3 brick. And there's also like the new spike system. Um, a lot of it's similar, a lot of it's there's a good amount of new stuff, but uh, this will be relevant information. This is the Lego Mindstorms EV3 programmable brick. It's the brains of the Lego robots. It can read sensors and other inputs, perform calculations, and control motors and other outputs. It takes six AA batteries or uses an EV3 rechargeable battery that can be charged using the appropriate wall charger. The battery clicks into the back of the EV3 brick like so. The EV3 brick turns on by pressing this middle button. As it starts up, we'll show some other features of the EV3 brick. Along the bottom are four input sensor ports labeled one through four. Along the top are four output motor ports labeled a through D. Using wires, you can connect sensors to the bottom of the EV3 brick. Here's a color sensor being connected to port 3. 
or you can connect motors to the top. Here's a motor being connected into port C. In addition to sensors and motors, it's possible to connect various other Lego pieces to the connection points along the sides of the brick for creating more complex robotic structures. Along the top is a USB port. Here's where a USB cable can be plugged in for connecting the EV3 brick to your computer. This is for programming or collecting data. There's a second USB port along the side. This port is used for daisy chaining multiple EV3 bricks together or for connecting a Wi-Fi dongle. Additionally, there's an SD card expansion slot, which allows adding extra memory to the brick. Now that the EV3 brick has started up, you can shut down by using this back button and confirming. Yeah, so the EV3 is um, basically uh, one of the heaviest components also of the robot. So the, the brick itself is often what's designed around. So uh, we'll talk more about this in our uh, robot design review, but uh, because it's the heaviest, you want to make sure that your robot is designed to also keep it like, near the center and um, protected, but also accessible because you're going to need to be you know, clicking buttons and stuff on it during the match. Uh, the next main part are the motors. Um, so this slide is going to cover the types of motors, and then the next one, we're actually going to talk about how motors themselves work and how they can be controlled. Here we'll discuss the two types of motors found within the EV3 kit. First one here on the left is a large motor, which looks something like this. And here on the right, we're comparing it against what's called the medium motor. And the first thing to notice is that the axis of rotation on these two is slightly different. Here on the large motor, if you put an axle through it, the rotation actually goes uh, parallel to the plane here. First on the medium motor, the axle goes here in the front, which means the angle of rotation is about that. Second, some more comparisons between the two. The large motor actually has more power and as a result is able to exert more torque which is definitely a positive. However, there is more play in the motor itself, and that can you can see by just wiggling it right here, where without even moving the motor, it moves a little bit. In comparison to that, the medium motor has less power and thus less torque. However, it also has less play, which in this case is a positive. And we can see that actually by using an axle, putting it in, and you can see that there's very little play that barely moves. When connecting motors to the EV3, there's many different ways in which to connect them along the different connection points. Here I've actually just used two of the black connector pins and can click it right into the side. You'll notice though, however, that this is not very structurally sound. These motors wiggle a lot along that connection point. And so there's a little trick you can do, just using a beam and some connector pins, plugging in here along the back to actually turn this into a quite sturdy structure. Now those motors don't move much at all by adding that perpendicular pin. Yeah, so those are the two main types of motors. Um, and then with the spike, there's also a, a little, I think there's another motor as well, but it, it falls under similar categories. Um, and then the next slide, it's going to be kind of a uh, 
more complex explanation of motors and how they really work. So I think uh, moving up from FLL, it's, in, it's important to understand, to have an understanding of how motors actually work. So you can figure out what's going on when you give a motor a command. Um, so FLL motors, if you take one apart, you'll find it's more than just like what a regular motor looks like um, because they're servo motors, which means they have uh, built-in encoders, which is like a little thing that can measure the rotation of the output. Um, and it also has built-in control software that allows you to basically say, like, uh, move this many rotations or, or move to this position. Um, and so this video is a little complex. Uh, I guess we're, we're going to skip it for now, but if you really want to get into the motor control and how motors work, um, then that would be a good thing to watch. Welcome back. OK. Uh, so the last kind of topic in the system overview is localization. So localization is a big uh, research topic in robotics because the problem with robots in general is we tell them to do stuff and they just don't do it. So if you tell a robot to move forward uh, a certain amount um, or move forward for a certain amount of seconds or like rotate 90 degrees, uh, it often will be pretty, pretty inaccurate. Um, and so that's like an open loop system where you just give it commands. And most rookie FLL teams will use open loop systems where you just give the robot commands in terms of time or, or distance. Um, and that often doesn't work well because uh, a slight variation, a slight bump, or you know, just the nature of the, the robot itself will cause it to be really inaccurate. And you'll end up running into missions and getting penalties and that sort of stuff. Um, so it's often really, uh, yeah, so that's what often you see in rookie teams. Um, the more advanced teams, you'll see them using a lot of sensors and um, using the playing field itself to basically have their robot correct its own location. Um, so localization is just the process where robots use feedback from their environment to recalculate their own position and um, follow, basically refollow a path. And so if you look at like an FLL map, you'll see a bunch of colored lines everywhere. You notice that there's like rectangular walls on the outside. So those are some things that can be used for localization. Uh, and on the next slide, um, another team's going to talk about some of the sensors and how they can be used. Hi, I'm Chase. And I'm Noah. And we're back and I'd like to talk to you about some sensors for the LEGO EV3 robot. Sensors are of great importance when building a robot. They help your robot orient itself around the playing field. There are several different types of things that sensors can do, such as detecting color, detecting motion, and they can also detect bumps. So the first sensor I'd like to talk about is the gyro sensor. The gyro sensor is a very good sensor and it's probably one of the most important sensors for your robot. You'll want to use this to make your robot go straight and do more precise turning. You can turn an exact number of degrees, like turning 90 degrees. And also, you can make your robot go in such a straight line that you can actually make it correct itself if it goes wildly off. Even if you turn it all the way around, your robot can correct itself with a gyro sensor. Next up, we'd like to talk about the touch sensor. As you can see, the touch sensor has a button on it. This button detects, obviously, bumps, or whenever you run into something. You can also place an axle into it, which could extend the button. You can assign certain actions to the button, or the touch sensor. These actions could be things such as making a noise, or determining if your robot should go a certain direction. This is useful for when you're trying to navigate the playing field, and you know your robot's going to run into something, so you can implement that into the program to go, when it runs into this wall, I want it to turn right and then move forward 20 rotations. The next sensor we'd like to talk about is the color sensor. You can tell it's a color sensor because it has this lens on the front of it. The color sensor bounces light off of different colors and it can tell you different if it sees different colors and it can also tell you the intensity of light. So you can make your robot follow lines on the playing field because the playing field has black lines. You can also tell it to stop at lines and you can also tell distance with it. It's pretty useful and you need to make sure you calibrate it which I can show you in a later programming video. 
Next up, we'd like to bring up the infrared sensor. This is a very cool sensor considering the fact that it has eyes. And it does the same thing that eyes do. It allows you to tell the, diff the distance between two objects. Being, one being the infrared sensor and then another object being something like a wall. The infrared sensor could also do another cool thing. It can allow you to use the remote for your EV3 robot. The remote allows you to control your robot wirelessly and instead of having to program your robot. It's pretty cool, but in the FLL competition, you're not allowed to use it because you have to program your robot to be autonomous and run fully programmed throughout the field. So you're not allowed to use the infrared sensor. There is, however, a solution. You can use the ultrasonic sensor, which is able to do the same things as the infrared sensor, but it cannot connect to a remote. You can also use a color sensor for shorter distances. The last of the sensors are not traditional sensors because you can't really place them on the robot. They're built into the robot. So one of these sensors is the rotation sensor. It tells you how far the motor itself has spun and it's the exact amount the motor has moved. Now this isn't the distance that the robot has moved because depending on speeds and such, it can go faster and slower and farther or shorter. And another one of the sensors that's built into this is the time sensor, which means if you wanted your robot to move for five seconds in a straight line, you can do that and your robot will be able to tell you after five seconds has passed. The time sensor is also very helpful for when you're doing the gyro sensor because it helps tell the gyro how long to run for when your robot is correcting itself while it's going straight. Thank you for watching our video. We hope that we taught you something important regarding sensors. In our next few videos, we'll be teaching... Okay, that was pretty much it for this week. Uh, are there any questions? Um, and then, stop recording.